Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Dropping the Gloves. Thanks for joining us here. It's gosh, it's another beautiful day, Tim. It's it's unbelievable. It's a nice Wednesday here in Traverse City. I'm about to hit the road, head to Chicago. I haven't been in a while. So it's nice. I'm gonna go in studio today. They play the St. Louis Blues. Very, very big game for both teams. Huge game. Just kidding. It's an awful. It's a late season game that has no business even being played. But it'll be fun. I get to go and see uh see all my buddies. Call the game. And uh, actually, the Hawks have been playing well lately. So maybe they'll eco to win. They beat the, the Dallas Stars the other day. What's what's the season like at this point when you're completely out of the playoff picture? Like, are you still trying to win the game? Do the shift more to guys working on certain things or chemistry or just staying healthy and, and, and wearing it out? Like, what what's the mindset? It, it shifts to completely selfish thoughts. I need to get points. I need to get ice time. I need to open eyes for next year because a lot of the guys are either contracts expiring or looking to renew a contract or trying to solidify their spot in the lineup because bad teams don't really have a lot of high end players. It's a lot of guys who are trying to figure out what they're doing next year. So you're you're doing everything you can to solidify your spot for the the next year. So, yeah, it's it's all selfish. So anybody who says, oh, you know, we're, we're building for next year. No, you're not. You're trying your best to get a contract. You yourself, you could care less if you win or lose. So yeah, that's that's what the Hawks guys are doing right now. A lot of them are just kind of fringe players. Rockford, Chicago, Blackhawks, where are you going to end up? And so they're really, like, they're playing good hockey. And it's because selfishly they, they want to stay in the NHL. They could care less about winning. And I think that's the way it should be. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Like, they're not going to be diving in front of a shot to block it. You know what I mean? Because they don't care if they lose. So but they, they'll be trying their hardest to get up in that rush for, for a point. Are they just like working mindsets. on specific skills at this point too, or would that wait until the summer? Like nah. if Tenorti struggles with the breakout pass, is he focusing more on that this last month or? No, that ship has sailed. <laughs> he's, he's always struggled with the breakout pass. <laughs> you know, never. Example. I'm not thinking on the guy. I just uh... He's actually been playing. Okay. He's a good but player. no, they're they're not. Maybe maybe guys like Connor Bedard, who was just starting out in his career, and like Korchinski and younger guys potentially because they're getting more ice time. That that helps. But as a whole, like a guy like Nick Foligno, he's been around forever. He's just playing out the stretch. You know, he's he's not trying to get hurt. He's just trying to you know four more games. Let's get them over with. Get to the summer so I can enjoy myself. Like he he's. He's being smart with his body at this point. I don't. I don't think he's going to jump anybody. I don't think he's going to, you know, do anything silly to affect his health. Like Four my games. biggest mistake was with Buffalo last game of the year. I fought Justin Johnson. I knew oh, in, right. my, in my mind. I was like, I, don't do it. Don't do it. Why are you doing it? And then something was just like, yeah, whatever. Just fight him. Who cares? Biggest mistake of my career. Should have never fought him, but I did, and I got beat up. But it was, yeah, last game of the season. I got an assist that game too, by the way. Yeah. I was I was concussed the whole game. He hit me, buried me. I was on Queer Street the whole game. I was just loopy. Because I remember Zen and Canopto was playing. Or no, it was the other guy. Um, the Gallant kid was there too. And Gallant was running around trying to fight Coletta. And I remember I ran into Gallant. I was just completely not even engaged in the game. I was just skating around. Like, just, I couldn't do anything. It was such a bizarre feeling. I've never had that before or after. I was 100% concussed. And I looked at Galan, I'm like, I don't, I'm going to fight you. And he's like, no, 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 no. And I was like, thank goodness, because I, I could not have fought him. Like, I was so out of it, Tim. It was bizarre. But I got an apple. And a fight. What if he had said yes? Then I would have had to fight him, I think. I don't know. It was It was a weird game. It was the last game of the year. I was concussed. I was embarrassed for losing the fight. I got an assist, which was great. And I, they were just running around. The stupid Islanders is so stupid. They called up their goon squad for the last game of the year. And everybody was just hungry to fight. I was just like, damn it. And in your position, you can't really be like to your teammates being like, hey, I'm not feeling great or I'm not 100%. And like if anything happens, you know, Gergensen's, can you take on Golan? Like you yeah, can't right? do that. No. And again, I'm... S- much like what we just talked about, I'm trying to get a contract for the next year. I'm yeah. trying to do stuff. And I'm like, I, and going through my mind, I'm like, I just got beat up. I just ruined my negotiations in the offseason. I had a great year. I'd beat up um, 
Thornton. I had done a lot for the team, and I was like, this is going to be a good offseason. I'm going to get some do re me. Then I do something stupid and get beat up by this little guy. I was like, <laughs> what a what an idiotic move. And on top of it, I'm just like concussed. So it is what it is. It's It wasn't my finest moment. But yeah, these guys are just trying to... They're honestly trying to get money for next year. That's what it all boils down to. You want a contract. And that's what they're playing for right now. But anyways, moving on. Uh, anything you want to touch on, Tim? Any personal stuff? Nothing? <laughs> no. No, my mom listened to Monday's episode. She was laughing. Oh. She was like, John's pretty pushy, isn't he? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm okay with it. Pushy how? Just digging for information. Pushing the conversation in a certain direction when you have an idea of where you want it to go. I'd like to say motivating. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm encouraging. I'm encouraging because I know you want to, I, I know you want to talk about it. And sometimes it takes, you're like an onion. I'm trying to peel away the layers. There's nothing really good in the middle, but I'm peeling away the layers. Ha 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 ha. All right. Before we get into it, this episode is brought to you by bet nine, nine. You think it's 99 because of Gretzky? Yes. Could be. Could be. I wonder if Wayne's involved in this. If he's like the owner, the shadow owner. I guess we'll never know. But this episode is brought to you by Bet99. It's voted number one online gaming experience in Canada with same game parlays, player props, and flash bet markets. Elevate your experience at Bet99. Remember the flash mobs that used to just dance? You ever do that? No. No, did you? Team ever do it? No. I thought it was really fun. Like the sharks, something the sharks would have done. <laughs> it does seem like something they would have orchestrated. You're right. Today's pick. Steven Stamkos. He had a hat trick last night. He's got six game goal streak. Did you know that, Tim? Six games in a row he scored a goal. That's <sighs> 10 goals he's had in that stretch. That's that's a lot for Steven Stamkos. But there's some caveats here. If you want to play Bet 99, you have to be 19 plus. You have to be responsible. And <laughs> it's only available to people in Ontario, Canada, unfortunately, because Bet by Bet 99 is built by Canadians specifically in Ontario for Canadians specifically in Ontario. So it's not built by any other Canadians, only those in Ontario. And it's for Canadians, but only those in Ontario. Isn't that funny? I wonder why. Like, why can't they go to any other province? Why is it only Ontario? It's a mystery. It's above our is it because grade. Wayne Gretzky's from Brantford? Or is it Brampton? Brantford or Brampton? I haven't driven through the city know. in a while. Where is he from, Tim? I don't know. I don't know. There's no way of knowing. I'm not going to Google it. Where's Bobby Orr from? Uh, uh, is that from like Parry Sound or something? Parry Sound, Tim. Yep. Nice. Yeah. Well, we used to vacation there in the summer in Snug Haven, Parry Sound. Beautiful area. Bobby he's Orr, right your, there. He's he's in the background. A little angel. Very much very famous there. goal. What what people don't know, they were already winning three nothing in the series, and so they were going to win the cup. It was just he was milking it. I feel like. All right, Tim. Lots happened last night. A lot of moving parts, a lot of teams jockeying for positions, but I don't think we want to go down that road again. We, we've done a lot of just, oh, this team's winning, this team's losing, play up position. So let's just go through some miscellaneous headlines. Let's do, this is our, our hodgepodge episode where we're just going to cover a lot of things and just, just have a good time with it. You know what I mean? There's, there's no real structure to this one. First, let's start off with my arch nemesis, Alex Govechka. He uh, can't stop scoring. He started the season just in an absolute funk. I was the happiest guy on earth. Oh, he's played 40 some games. He only has six goals. This is fantastic. He stinks. He sucks. Well, now he just scores every time he shoots the puck. He scores even when he doesn't shoot it. He's up to 30 goals he got last night and a big goal for him. They beat the Detroit Red Wings two to one. We'll touch on that in a second, but he gets 30 and now he's broken a record 18 straight seasons with 30 goals. He is at 852. He's got 42 goals to go. What do you think, Tim? Do you, do, are you finally ready to change your mind and say that he will break this record? <laughs> Here's my question back to you. Like, are you, I know you joke about him being your nemesis because you want to be right that he doesn't do it. But does, wouldn't you rather be wrong and have him break the record? Like, aren't you rooting for the guy? Aside from the fact that you have been on record saying he won't break it, but don't you want him to break it? Wouldn't you rather be wrong? Listen, these dirty Russians are taking over our game, and I don't like it. I'm a pure Canadian. Um, they're going to – don't clip that part. Um, yeah, 
I think it would be good if he broke the record. So I guess when, I was being realistic, right? Or I don't think he would, but now he's changed my mind. We're going to have to reevaluate this in the off season. He still has two years left on his contract and he probably will score two more goals in the next four games. So that means he's down to 40 goals needed to break the record. And do they count playoff goals? Does that, did they count that? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. 40 goals in two years is definitely attainable, but I, I do want him to break it because when it's all said and done, he is the greatest goal scorer of our generation and of all generations of all time. I feel like he has set the standard and Gretzky was scoring goals that had no business going in. But on the other side of that, Gretzky probably didn't do the same training as Alex Ovechkin did. Like there was no subway back in the day. There was no Cheetos. Like Ovechkin has so many more advantages that Gretzky <laughs> had. So yeah, I, I hope he breaks it. I still don't know if he will. So Ovechkin's got 30 goals right now and he's like 50. 55 years old, but yeah, Austin Matthews with 66 right now. And we're going to talk about that next. But Sam Reinhart, Sam Flip and Reinhart is 53 goals. How many would, Flip. how many would Prime Ovechkin had in 23, 24? You know what I mean? Like in his prime when he was scoring 50 plus, 60 plus back when he was 23 years old. I mean, this would be, he'd have a lot. But do you think it's easier to score goals now? Is that what you're saying rather than what he was doing? 10 years ago? Because I feel like 10 years ago, it was easier to score. Well, you're looking 20 years ago for him now. You know, He hasn't so. been in a league for 20 years. Stop. Wasn't he drafted in 04? Maybe yeah. he has been. I don't know. He's been around a he long time. Been. But I, I feel like he, he wouldn't be hitting the 66 like Matthews is. I know Volvi's good, but Matthews is. He could be better. It, it's, it's bizarre to me that Ovechkin has not hit 66 in his career. Because you would think he would have like a 70-goal season, a 72-goal season. But no, he has just been consistently 45-plus his whole career in that range. And that's why he's been so great. And that's why he has 852 goals. It's the longevity. It's the consistency. Whereas Matthews, he's, who knows, 66 one year and next year he might get 20. Just kidding. He's good too. But let's, let's stick on the Washington Capitals. They had a huge game. Massive game last night. Playoff implications out the yin-yang. Both, both teams playing in their 78th game within points of each other. The Detroit Red Wings went in with 84. The Washington Capitals went in with 83. The game happened. Capitals went 2-1 to one in regulation, thanks to Alex Ovechkin getting the game winner. They leapfrogged the Detroit Red Wings, and they now have 85 points. The Red Wings have 84 points. So the Capitals now hold on to the final wild card spot. Did you watch any of this game, Tim? What did you think of the effort of the Detroit Red Wings? I didn't watch uh, much of it. I caught part of the second period. I, uh, I'm a little bit surprised. I, I kind of thought in my mind that it was going to come down to the Islanders, the Penguins, and the Wings, and two of those three teams. I knew how close it was, but it just seemed like I just – the Capitals, I, I don't want them to be in. If it's the Capitals, Capitals and the Islanders, just so boring. But to their credit, they win last night. They win in regulation. That's the most important part of all of this, the fact that they stole two points away from the Wings and didn't get, grant them any because if they had – the wings would be ahead of the, the Caps right now. So big win for them. And the, the probably the, the the most important part of that game was Charlie Lindgren. 42 saves, yeah. one goal allowed with like 1.1 second left in the third, a little throwaway goal, just outstanding effort from him. And the Capitals right now are looking pretty good to hold on to that spot. Yeah, I was going to mention that. He's the only reason they won. Detroit pretty much carried the game. They throw f the 43 shots on net. They threw almost 100 pucks his way, and he just played fantastic. Like This this is a microcosm of the Washington Capitol season is just epitomized in this one game. You play average. You know, you, you don't really do too much. Your goaltender stands on his head, and you somehow, some way, win a one-goal game that you have no business winning. And this has been their, their story the whole season. All the advanced analytics, all the inside stats – if you were to play this game 100 times on NHL, whatever uh, console, Washington loses this game 99 times, but they win it. They don't, they don't know how they won it. They don't know why they won it, but they win it. And this has been them the whole season long. They are the luckiest team I've ever seen, Tim. Luckiest team I've ever seen. Detroit should have won this game. That's, that's all there is to it. Charlie Lindgren played fantastic. 42 saves. Are you kidding me? You played fantastic. So this this is just it's it's their year. They are they are the charm team, and I feel like 
The Flyers were that team for a while, and that's wearing off a little bit. But this is the Washington Capitals here. They're just the bounces are going their way. Their goaltenders are playing great. If they lose a game, they lose it a, like ninety five to two. If they win a game, they win it two to one or three to two. All their wins are by one goal. All their losses are just getting blown out. So whatever they're doing, they need to keep doing it. But it's like the wheels have to fall off. I don't think this team makes the playoffs still. I'm still standing with my New York Rangers, New York Islanders ticket. I think, or sorry, not New York Rangers. I feel like it's going to be the Pittsburgh Penguins, New York Islanders. Those are my two picks, but boy, these capitals will not go away. Just when I think they're going to lose and they're just going to start falling off. Like Charlie Lindgren, Tim. Charlie flipping Lindgren is playing fantastic hockey. And he just, he's carried this team last night. It was, it was a lopsided affair. Like it was just two to one shots, Washington, Detroit, the zone time, the possession, everything. And Charlie Flip and Lindgren keeps him in it. But yeah, it's moving on. What else are we talking about? Well, you mentioned Matthews. He had his 66th goal last night, which is more than Ovi ever scored in a season as high as 65. It's also the most goals that um, in, a, in a single season since Mario, Mario Lemieux had 69 in 95, 96, which was before Austin Matthews was born, which is just crazy. Um, and I, I wanted to call that out and also pull out a little quote from Nico Heischer, the captain of the New Jersey Devils. A few people sent this to me because you've been pretty critical of Matthew's two-way play, even though all the advanced stats are, are, are talk about how good he is without the puck when you look at like possession time and, and um, breaking up passes and poke, stat, poke checks and all that stuff. A quote from Nico Heischer, who was a finalist for the Selkie Trophy last year, said that Matthew should be nominated this year. He said, quote, it's always hard when you score 65 goals to be the best defensive forward, but he definitely deserves to be there. John, your comment? Everybody is entitled to their opinion. I just <laughs> go back to the common sense thing. Okay. If you had the choice to pick one forward, if you're up by a goal and the other team's pressing and you're playing defense and you have to, you know, play shutdown defense, who would that fo- who would those three forwards be? Would Austin Matthews come to the top of your mind? Oh, I really want him on the ice. I know he's like he's he's good in the faceoff circle. I'll give him that. He's he's playing, you know, good there. But do do you want him as that forward on the ice, Tim? I don't think so. I think there's a lot of other forwards I'd rather have out there in that position. I think Matthews gets the spotlight because he does score so many goals, and people do put him in that category because we'll look at. He's playing really, really great. Yeah, he he has improved his defensive game. Is he one of the top defensive forwards in the game? There's no flipping way he's a top defensive forward. But he's he's vastly improved. But come on, like give me a break. Like let's look around the league. There's every team has someone better than him. I would take Nick Felino over him if we're going back to the Chicago Blackhawks. Jason Dickinson. There's Barkov, there's Kucherov, there's Ryan O'Reilly, there's all these guys who are much, much better. Even a guy like Jordan Stahl, like all of these players, like Tim, there's there's dozens and dozens and dozens of players who are better defensively than Matthews. But not I Kucherov. Not Kucherov, but yeah. I, I would take Kucherov over Matthews in the D zone, 100%. Uh, come on. No. But I would. yeah, point taken. And I just think it's cool that it carries weight from a guy that, you know, has been nominated multiple times, Nico Heeshear. And, um, I think he knows a little, a thing or two, just like you would know a thing or two about. He sure sucks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Devils fans are going to hate me. But I get it. I get it. He does deserve some recognition. Does he deserve a flipping trophy? I don't think so. I, I think we need to pump the brakes on that. Even the Maple Leafs. So I guess they do put him out there in the last minute of the game. They they have put a lot of trust in him. I will give Sheldon Keith that. They, they've, they've stressed putting him in positions where he has to play defense. He's taking D zone draws. He's out there in the last minute of the game when they're up by a goal. So he has been playing those big minutes. He's on the PK. Good for him. Because I, I love that when I played on a team and the star guys did everything. Because they are the best hockey players. They have the best sense. They have the best hands. They have the best everything. So when I was on a team like Chicago and I saw Marion Hosa killing penalties and Jonathan Taves was like, hell yeah, this is fantastic. Yeah. Like it's a double threat. You get them on the ice. It's never a bad thing when you have your best players on the ice. So on the, on the other side of it, I played with Minnesota. And the Rangers and Gabby used to sit on the bench. I'm like, yeah, like kind of a waste. He was he was he was a one trick pony. He was an offensive juggernaut, terrible in the D zone. And there's a lot Good of point. Patrick Kane the same way. So it's nice to see those guys branching out and doing things. It's also it's fun to see him out there. All right, 
Speaking of um, guys doing everything and friends of the show, Seth Jarvis, Tim, a breakout year for him, maybe? Yeah, he had a, a beautiful shorthanded goal last night. Did you see this? It was, no, uh, I don't uh, follow with Seth Jarvis. I don't follow Okay, on, on the Bruins game, yeah. Um, penalty kill and rushing up, shoots it on net, gets the rebound, tucks it around, uh, wrap around, throws it over Swayman's pad, and um, just really made the Bruins guys look like they were standing still. Now he's at 30 goals on the year, which is a huge step forward for him on 63 points so far. It's a total breakout year, and he's playing a lot, getting a lot of trust. He has been up and down the lineup. He's, you know, and played anywhere from the first, second, and third line, depending on who's healthy, who's going on a different night. But he's averaging 18 minutes, 40, eight, 46 seconds per game, um, getting a lot of trust. And the other thing, too, is just like he's getting the mic in his face just a lot this year. And people are learning what we learned two years ago, just how great of a personality he is and all that. My question for you is he's still only 22 years old, which I had to double check. I couldn't believe that. He's an RFA after this season. What kind of deal do you think he signs? Is he signing long term? Is he signing three or four years to get him to his UFA season? What do you think his number would look like? Well, knowing the Hurricanes, they're going to try to get him to a long term deal. But they, you know, they got Aho locked up. They got Svechnikov. They got Kaki and Emmy locked up long term. So I think he fits in with that group. And yeah, I, I think they try to get him to a seven, eight year deal. He he has shown he is that guy. He came in his rookie year. They had the nice playoff run. He was playing good, but still raw. He's fine tuned his game. He's playing fantastic hockey and his points have just nothing but increased. He had 40, actually then 40 again, but now he's up to 63. But seven million, seven years. Would that be fair for Seth Jarvis? I know, I know you're losing on the first half of the contract, but I figure he's still improving. And he will, you know, be that guy when he comes out of the end of the contract and, you know, the cap's increasing. So if I'm Don Waddell, yeah, I think $7 million would be a good number for everybody involved. Don't you think? Or is that too high? Because right now you're paying Aho 9.75. Svechnikov is 7.75. I think he fits right in along those guys. Maybe just a step behind, but you're paying for his potential. And that's why you're getting 7 for 7 or 7 for 8. So... I think that would be a smart number for everybody involved. I don't know. Am I am I off base here? Well, it depends on what you think his offensive ceiling is, because you know that he's got a responsible game, and you know that you can you know rely on him to to do certain things on the D zone and without the puck. Is he a sixty point player moving forward? Does he continue to evolve and grow and put up like seventy, eighty, ninety points? I, depending on where you think his ceiling is, I think it's probably I think eighty points would be like a fantastic year. At his best season, I don't know that you're going to get that multiple times over the course of seven years. So maybe I'm more a little bit lower, but I wouldn't be surprised just given what some of these younger contracts have been that he gets something around seven by seven. Yeah, and maybe they just do the bridge and get him to the last RFA year and give him three years. But it's a big, big off season for the Hurricanes. They got him and they got Jake Gensel. What do you do with Gensel? Yeah, they didn't really give up much one. to get him, but yeah, we'll we'll see what happens with the Carolina Hurricanes. They they don't like spending money too much, but they did break the piggy bank for Kaki and Emmy. That was kind of a a different form of negotiating for them, but good for Seth Jarvis. It's fine. You know what else is good? Tim Wendy's. Hamburgers, specifically. And their Frosties are also delicious, too. And the only thing sweeter than the taste of victory, like Seth Jarvis just had versus the Bruins yesterday when they won 4-1, to the only thing sweeter than that is starting your day with a new Cinnabon pull-apart from Wendy's. Oh, Sounds delicious, but there's no reason you can't have both, Tim. Now that Wendy's and Daily Faceoff Fantasy are giving you a chance to win weekly prizes all season long, all season long. Season's almost over, so you better get on it. And hey, even if you make a few wrong picks, at least you know you're heading to Wendy's right now for a $5 Cinnabon pull apart and a small coffee. It's always a great choice. It's always a great choice. So sign up for Daily Faceoff today, sponsored by Wendy's and the Wendy's app. So check it out, Wendy's. I, I wanted to touch on this. The New York Rangers played the New York Islanders last night. Very huge game for the New York Islanders. Massive playoff implications. Other than the Washington-Detroit game, this is probably the one everybody else is watching. Rangers wanting to get ready for the playoffs. They're playing really good hockey. The Islanders hungry. And this is always a big rivalry. Even when I was in New York, it was a big rivalry playing the Islanders. It was just fun. Crosstown rivals, a little brother, like, ah, Islanders suck. The Islanders have a good chant when we play. We played there in the old Coliseum. I, well, I won't sit here on the show. It's a kid's show. Anyways, they had a heck of a game last night. 
All is said and done, the Islanders went 4-2 to two with an empty net goal. Played fantastic. Really, really good hockey. They dominated the Rangers in the first period, and they kind of coasted the second and the third. Things got a little spicy in the third period. Nikita Zabinajad. Is it Mika? Why do they call him Nikita? Mika. Mika Zabinajad. He was skating through the neutral zone, and he collided with Adam Pellick. Total innocent play. Zabinajad goes down, has to go back, do the concussion protocol. He comes back later in the game. Peter Laviolette, not happy. Post-game, he's calling it a vicious predatory hit. He said it was not accidental. And he said he thought it was definitely on purpose. And Pellick is just a, a vicious player. That hit shouldn't be in the game. And it just got me thinking. It's like, what about Matt Rempe? Like, what did he, did he, did, was he strongly condemning those hits when he was bearing New Jersey Devil players, Tim? When he's like elbowing and shouldering guys in the head and just be, and I like Matt Rempe, but you have to call a spade a spade and you have to call a hypocrite a hypocrite. Like, you can't have it both ways. You can't. Have a guy on your team just ripping around, burying people, like out of control. And then have someone on your hit guy someone on your team get hit and a very innocent hit. And then all of a sudden lose your marbles and say, Oh, it's vicious, it's predatory. He did it on purpose. We can't have that kind of stuff in a game. It's terrible. It's terrible. I know you didn't see it because you were crying over the Bruins loss. But this this stuff drives me bonkers when coaches do this. It, it loses all credibility in your coaching. Is does he have to stop sticking up for his player at some point? And just be a realist and go, yeah, I guess we do it, so it's going to happen to us. What is your take, Tim? Yeah, I saw it this morning, and I saw people talking about the hit and Laviolette and all that. So I pulled up the hit, and I was like, you know, thinking, okay, here we go. And it was like so just innocuous, just like incidental contact. I understand that it could have hurt to been a jet. I understand that you're upset that your guy got his cage rattled was not an intentional hit in any way that I can see. You know what I mean? Like that stuff happens all the time. It happened to a ref the other day too. Like yeah. that's people just collide. And and I don't think how you could look at that and think it was a predatory hit on Zabana Jet. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I, I would be okay if a coach saying that if they hadn't the month prior had one of their players just go on a murder spree and like hit everybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just it's it's pot calling the kettle black. It's it's very strange to me. I think he Took it too far. And I just, uh, I don't like Lapula. I feel like some, he's got one of those faces. And he doesn't even mention the Dobson hit on Trochik in the last minute of the last 15 seconds of the game. Yep. Dobson buries Trochik from behind. No call. <laughs> Islanders pick up the puck, go down and score their 4 2 empty netter. But where, where's, where's the outrage on that? That was a more dangerous hit in my eyes. Dobson completely buries him from behind. And Trochik goes down. He's upset, rightfully so. Like, you don't like Trochik? You like Zabinajad more? I don't understand that. But all that aside, Laviolette being a donkey, let's talk about the Rangers just for a little bit. Because I took a lot of heat from people saying, oh, you're too critical of them. They're a really good team. They're going to do great. You don't know what you're talking about. Greg Wyshynski had a nice article on ESPN a couple of days ago saying, are the Rangers for real? And it was a long-ass article. I didn't read the whole thing. A lot of, a lot of material to go through. But it did solidify a lot of the things I was touching on. Great power play, average to below average five on five, getting really great goaltending. Those are the recipes that I that I think are are troublesome. Winning a lot of one goal games, relying on your power play, not a lot of depth scoring third and fourth line, not contributing very much. Really, really heavily weighted goals. When you look at their team, their top six. All playing fantastic. Their bottom six are just terrible. I think the highest guy is like 30 points. That's not terrible, but it's not good for a playoff team hoping to win the Stanley Cup. Are the Rangers, Tim, and this might hit home, this year's Boston Bruins, winning the President's Trophy, losing in the first round? Because all of the telltale signs are there. A lot of one goal games are winning. Really strong goaltending play. Five on five isn't great. In the playoffs, not a lot of power plays given out. The refs let a lot of stuff go. So you have to be able to generate offense five on five. And specifically, you have to have depth scoring. And the Rangers don't have that. People are like, oh, Roslevic's fantastic. He was, a, he was a flipping healthy scratch, you guys, last game. Okay? <laughs> yeah. So can we just pump the brakes on everybody saying this is the second coming of Mark Messier? Like, he's going to be fantastic. He's going to carry these guys to the Stanley Cup. Healthy scratch. 
let's just, I'll, I'll leave that there. But Tim, are we seeing the Bruins 2.0? Well, probably. I, I think it's totally possible. And it depends on, of course, on who they play and who, you know, who nails down that second wild card spot. If it's the Islanders, if they don't lock down the third in the Metro, if they slip down there, I think they're a great candidate to upset them. I wouldn't say the same necessarily for the Capitals or the Wings, but anything's possible. Um, what if the Penguins? What if the Penguins jump the Capitals? Like I think they will. Yeah, that's another great one. And and it's, it's so weird because it feels like the the East is like even the Bruins. I'm not that confident in 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 the first round. You know what I mean? And they're the two best teams in the East, and neither of them feel like they're both primed for an upset. You know what I mean? And so the Rangers, all season long, it's had, they haven't felt like a team that I would think, okay, this is the year they're going on a run. And now we've been wrong before. So maybe the fact that we're thinking that means this is the year that they're going on a run because we think they're not going to. We, every time you think a team's finally, our time is now, the, the Bruins, the Leafs, whatever, the Canes, and then they don't do it. So maybe the Rangers will prove us wrong. But it does seem like they're a team that just is a paper tiger. Yeah, I tell you right now, if I'm looking at the East, there's four teams I would take over the Rangers going into this playoffs. I'm taking the Panthers, the Leafs, the Hurricanes, and the Lightning over the New York Rangers. So I, I don't trust them as far as I can throw them, and I got bad shoulders. So they um, they make me nervous, Tim. They honestly make me nervous, and I used to play for them. I have a lot of you know good memories of that city. No, I don't. I honestly didn't like playing in New York. It was a miserable city, and I, I know people love it. It just wasn't for me. You were only there it. for what? Four months? Four something? months. Four of the worst months of my life. Just bag skated. <laughs> I did go out and ha have a good time. I will say that. Me and uh, Zuccarello and uh, which was his name? Cheeks. Jeff Roy Whitka. Does, um, does Danielle follow you when you get traded at the deadline or does she wait to see where you end up? Or Nah, she came and visited a, like for a week or two. But no, I was riding solo. So it was fun. Like we would, you know, go out to eat and have a nice dinner and have a couple drinks and go to, you know, a beer garden afterwards. But just so many people. It was, it was a lot. It was, it was a lot going on there. But yes, the New York Rangers, look for them to lose in the first round. If I was a betting man, which I am on bet 99, only when I'm in Ontario, though, I'm betting on the team playing the New York Rangers. Speaking of uh, Ontario, the province right next door is Quebec. <laughs> and Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> they love this. You're Jujar Slikovsky. What's his first name? Yuhar? Yuraj. Yuraj Slikovsky. Yeah. Yeah. We just talked about Seth Jarvis having a breakout season. Slikovsky, former number one overall pick, obviously over Shane Wright, who's just a disaster two years ago. He is having a very, very quietly strong year. Started off a little bit slow on the first line. He's got Suzuki. He's got Caulfield. This first line for the Montreal Canadiens is quietly, quietly in a, in a national sense in the whole NHL. They're making a lot of noise in Montreal. They're quietly having a very, very solid season. He had his first hat trick last night, first of his career. For the year right now, he's almost up to 20 goals. He's almost up to 50 points. He's got 17 points in the past 14 games, Tim. So he is surging at the right time at the end of the season. Are, are we witnessing? something great on the horizon or is this just a good story to finish off the season like you mentioned oh you know at the end of the year trying to work on some stuff what what are we seeing from Sikovsky I think it's the first and we talked two weeks ago about Lafreniere and his like year by year uh breakout and compared it to guys like Jason Robertson and Braden Point and some of the others like that I think we're seeing something similar from Sikovsky and I looked it up on, on the on the calendar he just turned 20 on March 20th Crazy. Three weeks ago, it's just crazy how young he still is, and he's still growing into his body. He's strong, but he's playing so confident. And when you watch him play, too, it's not just that he's scoring. Like, he's moving well out there. He's making risky passes that are paying off. Like, you can really see him starting to blossom. And I feel like for that reason, it's a great story. And I just love when, you know, younger kids with all the pressure that, you know, don't play to their hype right away, and then they stick with it and start to grow. And it's just cool to see. Um, I think we are primed for a breakout season. It's so crazy, too, because if you look at, like, uh, you ever seen a list of the um, points leaders on teams that Carey Price was on? Mm -hmm. I don't think he ever played with a guy who was a point per game in all his years with Montreal, something like that, like it's or something close to that. So it's crazy to think that you haven't seen the production like that in 15-whatever years for a team that's, you know, been around forever. So I think Slavkovsky could grow to be that guy because he's such a complete game potential because of his size and because of his pedigree being a first overall pick. So I think it's something that we're going to see 
hopefully next year and certainly in the years after him being an elite player in this league. Yeah, I agree. He's getting stronger. He put a ton of weight on this year. He went from like, I think, 220. Now he's almost up to 240. He's a big kid. So he's using his body a little bit more. He's obviously getting used to the NHL speed, the strength, and he's, he's having a good season. I, I see him maybe not Yager esque. I don't think he has the same skill as Yager, but boy, he's playing pretty good. He's a point per game guy in two years. I don't think he'll do it next year, but this is, this is a good sign for Montreal Canadiens. And it just, uh, again, everybody goes back to the cap. Well, what are you signing for? He has one year left on his first ELC. Obviously, super young. You do a bridge deal, get him five, six million, or do you just shoot for the eight years right away? I don't know what the question or what the answer is here, but uh, they must be pleased. If I'm, if I'm Montreal, I'm trying to lock him up this summer. I'm trying to extend him before next year because I think he's going to have a very strong season. He's going to be more expensive the longer I wait. Yeah. But long term or just a, a three year deal? Um, that's a good question. Probably long term. I don't know. You drafted him first overall. You, you, this is your guy. You do you do a seven year, eight year deal, and he's a free agent at twenty eight, twenty nine. So it could work out for both parties involved. But Kenton Hughes, he seems like he knows what he's doing. He hasn't made too many terrible decisions, but good for Sikowski. I like this. Not so good for somebody else, John Tortorella in specific. Not having a good month, Tim. Philadelphia Flyers. Eight straight losses for the Philadelphia Flyers. Not great. And they played the aforementioned Montreal Canadiens last night. He did, a, a must win. If there ever was one, they they've been Scutter, scuttle, skittering, just playing garbage. Seven in a row, losing to the Columbus Blue Jackets, the Buffalo Sabres of the world. They're just bad teams. And they had to have this win for this Montreal Canadiens. And they come out and just throw a stinker on the board. Give up an early goal. This 9 3 lost him. Absolutely no effort from the team. John Tortorella beside himself, trying to salvage some good from the game, saying, Oh, this is uncharacteristic of this team. Usually we have some battle, and I don't know what's happened the last few weeks, blah, 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 blah. I know what's happened. You ruin the fabric of this team, and it's showing <laughs> on the ice. And these guys don't want to play for you. They want to go. They want to hit the links. They're done. They're absolutely fed up. And that's all I have to say about it. Is there any, there's no more to say, right, Tim? It's just he broke this team. That's the reason they're losing. That's the reason they've gone from third in the Metro to I think they're fifth in the wild card chase. Staring up at everybody. They can't win. There's no effort. They just are a shell of them for themselves. A John Tortorella coach team is hardworking. They're disciplined. They're accountable. They score opportunistic goals. This team is not doing that at all in the last month. Ever since Big Mouth bench Couturier and doubled down on all this crap. And it's just it's just snowballed into this. They're out of the playoffs. I don't know. Is there anything else you want to add to this situation? Well, I just I saw a tweet last night about um, his press conference, and I think it was Wyshynski, one of those guys, that it's basically five minutes of him just realizing that it's over and trying to win the room back and, and yeah. build up for next year and build some confidence. It's no longer yeah. about riding the ship, no longer about the things they need to do to execute. It's all just about his relationship with the players at this point. Yeah, and I and I think we touched on the last episode. He knows he messed up. That's why he did the press conference earlier this week, where he's like, "My bad, you know, he's, he's, this team's good. We got to come together and galvanize the team, and we got to really do this together." He knows he messed up. He knows he he's in trouble here this offseason because I don't think Briere and Jones are gonna let that slide. If if he's lost the locker room, he'll be gone. He'll be absolutely gone. How amazing would it be if he wins the Jack Adams and he gets fired? <laughs> it could happen it could absolutely happen all right tim what are we doing next yeah a little game i put together you put me on the spot last week asking me the numbers of players which i was a little embarrassed by because i feel like i know all those numbers but it's no, tough you don't. when you're on the spot you don't it's tough, it's tough when you're on the spot but <laughs> no it's you not don't struggle, you don't struggle as much with numbers you struggle with names and so i'm going to keep it simple i'm not going to ask you to pronounce anything I'm going to give you 10 players, their last names. You have to tell me what their first name is. Mm. And it's going to start relatively easy. We'll get just progressive. But there's no, like, I'm not giving you the, the fourth liner for the Blue Jackets or some guy from Finland that has four X's in his name. Can it's I pull like, up daily face-off line combos? No. no. Keep my hands up here. It's just off the spot. Ready? Okay. So there's 10 names total. First one, DeBrusque. Jake. Oh god, I thought that was the easy one. Well, um, I almost said Louie because his dad. Oh uh, yeah. Uh Nelson. Brock. Yep. Point. Braden. Nice. Three for three. Heiskinen. Miko. Miro. Close. Miro. Damn it. Next, Colasar. Keegan. 
Nice. Hathaway. Garnet. All right. Krebs. Peyton. Nice. Faber. Brock. Merslickens. Elvis. Ottinger. Shoot. <laughs> you always get this one. Is it Jake? Yeah. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Did you get? Did you think like I? Right, which one I think it is, and it's got to be the one that it is. Yeah, I thought it was Jared. Did I nail them all? Except yeah. for Mira. 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 Yeah, that was pretty good. I, I yeah. like that game. We should do that more often. We'll do it. We'll do it once a month or something. More obscure though, because those are stars. All those guys okay. are well known. But yeah, let's get to this quick kids and get out of here, Tim. All right. For a limited time, our listeners get 25% off zero delivery fee on their first order of fifteen dollars or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter promo code Nation Twenty Five. Offer valid, of course, in Canada only, subject to change, terms, and conditions apply. This DoorDash, they won't give us U.S. codes. They really hate the USA. So it's only available in Canada. All right, New Jersey Devils. Bad news for you, Tim. Your boy, Jack Hughes, out for the year, shoulder surgery. Is this, can we just finally put the stamp on him and say you're a Band-Aid? Oh, my gosh. No, this is not bad news for me or for Jack. He's been playing through an injury. And now he's going to get healthy. When he's healthy next year, it's bad news for the rest of the league. That's what I'll say. I'm I know. I agree. He was on my fantasy team. He's fantastic. But the one knock on him that is self-imposed is the guy's a Band-Aid. He gets hurt every season. Last year, he had 99 points. If he would have played a full season, he would have gotten an elusive 100. Every season, Tim, he's gotten hurt. Every single one. Why? Why can't we call him a Band-Aid? Yeah, we probably can. Do you love him? I'm a, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. Until, All right, until what else? Proven otherwise. Speaking of injuries, defenseman Arbor Jackai from the Montreal Canadiens also going down for the season, shoulder surgery. A little bit of a concern. This is the second surgery he's had on that shoulder in the last two seasons. So having a great season, putting up decent numbers, obviously tough as an ox. This, this makes me nervous for a tough guy. Two shoulder surgeries in two straight years, for the type of game that he plays. I would tread lightly if I was him. I would be very, very nervous. I'd be wearing shoulder braces. I don't like this. I don't like this for a young kid who plays a very physical game. All right, moving on. One more. It was a hat trick night last night, Tim. Who got who got who got hat tricks? We mentioned Slokowski already and Stamkos, as well as Nate McKinnon, who's just had three unbelievable goals. Um, and then Butchacross tweeted this out. It's the first time that three first overall picks had hat tricks on the same night, which I thought was kind of cool. And the last question I have for you, John, this has been going around the Twitter sphere this week, a little bit of a debate. What's more impressive, 70 goals or 100 assists? 70 goals. Because you can get a second Sti- assist. Well, statistically, 100 assists is more rare. Um, only like is it three really? guys have done it. Yeah, and a few guys have gotten 70. But yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you. 70 goals is just amazing. But then you That's also bonkers. have the fact that yeah. empty net and all that too. So. That's true. So there's a lot of things that go into it. Empty netters, maybe we count those ones for half and see where we're at. If that was the case, Ovechkin would have 10 goals. So, <laughs> all right, moving on. I think that's all, everybody. We had a good show. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. We will talk to everybody on Friday. I'm going to get to Chicago. I hope you have a good Wednesday. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Dropping the Gloves with John Scott, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.